Thanks everyone for taking the opportunity to join us um, and welcome to Diversity in Clinical Research. Where are we today? And can data and technology play a role to improve diversity? So thanks to the Cambridge Innovation Institute for giving us this opportunity. My name is Jeff Morgan. I'm a managing director in Deloitte Consulting's life science practice, and I'll be the host and moderator for today. A uh, couple of housekeeping items, your phones and microphones are muted, but if you have questions, please type them into the chat in the lower right hand part of your screen and put the chat into public. We'll be monitoring the chat throughout the session and try to answer as many questions as possible. The session is also being recorded, so you will receive in a few days a link to the recording afterwards. Um, so I'm joined here today by an esteemed panel. Um, Ivy Cam from Regeneron, Chris Boone from Appy, and Sunil Dravita from Takeda. So I'd like each of them to give a brief introduction and then we could get started. So Ivy, maybe you go first. Sure, thanks Jeff. Um, hi everyone, uh, my name again is Ivy Cam and uh, I'm with Regeneron Pharmaceuticals uh, serving as the DEI Director of Sciences. Um, so, so happy today uh, to be invited here to serve on this panel along with Chris and Sunil. Um, so my experience uh, actually primarily has been in uh, clinical development and medical affairs. Uh, so spent about the last uh, 20 plus years at different companies such as Sanofi, uh, Novartis, and now at Regeneron for about 10 years. Um, so I've always been passionate about health equity um, in all the work that we do. Um, and fortunately this last year has moved into the global DEI office uh, to oversee all of our strategies from discovery, so early genomics research, to preclinical research, to diversity in clinical trials, all the way to uh, equitable um, access to our medicines. Um, so, you know, I, I really look forward to participating in this discussion today. Um, so thanks for having me here. Sure. Thanks, Abby. And Chris? Oh, I think we just lost Chris. Maybe Sunil, you'll go while Chris gets back on video. Sure, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Sunil Dravida. I am the uh, global head of the Real World Data Center of Excellence at Takeda Pharmaceuticals. Uh, overall, about 32 years in the industry, um, mostly with data and analytics, but I have supported uh, most of the large biopharma companies in the past 20 years uh, with the data and analytics uh, initiatives. And uh, I'm very passionate about real world data and real world evidence which is what I've been really doing for the past few years. So my remit at Takeda is to make sure we are getting the right kind of real world data at the right time in the right format to the constituents, all the way from drug discovery um, to post-market surveillance. And you know, clinical trials happens to be one of the central themes and making sure you know, we are representing the right population you know, in our trials and um, having the diversity is very critical and I'm very passionate about that. So thank you and uh, looking forward to the discussion. Great, thanks Sunil. And Chris? Thanks Jeff. Uh, sorry, I had a, a technical snafu just now, but uh, Chris Boone, um, Vice President of Global Head of Health Economics and Outcomes Research at AFV. Uh, you know, very excited to have this discussion. We've been talking about this for a number of years, but it seems like uh, more organizations are making uh, some tremendous progress in the space. Um, it's always good to sort of recalibrate and, um, and share any key lessons learned that we've learned along the way in hopes that folks can take from that or as well as add to that um, as part of the dialogue because we're all in this together. So looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thanks, Chris. So, so we, we could get right into it. So I think we all recognize that people may experience the same disease differently. And it's essential that clinical trials include people from a variety of lived experiences and backgrounds and conditions, as well as characteristics like race and ethnicity, age, sex, sexual orientation, so that all communities can really benefit from scientific advances. But we know we're not there yet today with, with research. When you look at you know, clinical trials today, or if you look at you know, the, the population in the US, 37% is of, of racial and ethnic minorities. But when you look at clinical trials, it, it is nowhere near that. So the bottom graphs down there give some statistics from, from uh, participants in trials. It's really a homogeneous population. A lot of the, the vast majority of participants are white. Very few are from those racial and ethnic minorities. So you know, I guess my first question to the panel is, you know, as, you, as you look at these numbers, um, 
you know, I'd like you to reflect and share your thoughts on it. Any any other relevant statistics? And and you know, what do you think about the state of of where we are today? So maybe I'll turn to Ivy first. Great, thanks, Jeff. So um, I think all of us who are on the panel and in attendance today um, understand that this is not new. Uh, this is something that we have been dealing with, like Chris said, for many, many years. And I, I think that um, one of the things that I've seen uh, change perhaps in the last few years is the fact that, and it's hard to say it's three years now that we're into this pandemic, is the um, the focus and the uh, highlight that the pandemic has shined uh, this light on the inequities that have been going on for many years. Um, and, and it really has raised it to the forefront of a lot of our minds, both in access to clinical care and to research. Um, and unfortunately, with the pandemic, they're happening simultaneously, research as part of clinical care sometimes. And so um, I think that now there is more attention, um, you know, on these problems, not just from the, um, you know, scientific point of view, but also from the ethical uh, responsibilities of uh, sponsors and researchers, as well as um, the uh, regulatory environment that has changed in the last few years um, from going from, you know, having guidances to why this is important and important to implement to uh, closing in on being mandatory to implement. Um, so, you know, there's definitely a lot more inequities that we are focusing on. Um, however, I think that the silver lining to all of that is, um, you know, I think that living through the pandemic for a lot of us um, have also helped us realize that, you know, we're all in this together. Uh, I think it blurs the line of, you know, us, you know, scientists, sponsors, researchers versus patients, because in many instances, we have been the patients. Uh, we have lost loved ones, and we know what it's like to not be able to access basic things like mask and test and the panic that go along with it. And so I think that brings maybe more of an empathy to the way that, you know, we're approaching um, diversity in clinical research, who should have access to research. How do we ensure that everyone has fair and equitable access to research and clinical care? And so I think that some of those um, uh, sort of newfound maybe empathy and humanness in the way that we approach this topic uh, is encouraging to me because we're not just looking at statistics. We know that, you know, it affects real people and we are part of it, our families, our friends, our colleagues. So um, kind of going away from the question a little bit from data, but I think that, you know, on the backdrop of data, which is obviously very important, and I know we'll get into that, um, I think that, you know, remembering that, you know, we're all people suffering from the same illnesses and, you know, how do we make sure that we're all represented in our clinical trial is um, a new appreciation that I think some of us um, have gained in the past few years. Your, your thoughts, Sunil, on kind of... Yeah, no, so well said, uh, Ivy. And um, <clears throat> yeah, so if you look at the numbers, you know, they're pretty profound, right? Um, and then, you know, we have made a lot of progress um, in the recent years to improve the diversity in clinical research, but I feel there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, historically, the clinical research has, you know, disproportionately included, you know, white male participants, which has, you know, led to a lack of uh, generalizability um, of the research findings, right, to other populations. Now, efforts have been made to increase the diversity in clinical research, right, by some of the mandates to include uh, the underrepresented groups in clinical trials, providing funding, you know, from for some of the minority health research, creating community outreach programs um, to increase the uh, to increase awareness and participation in research, and <clears throat> additionally, you know, um, the COVID nineteen pandemic also highlighted the importance of diversity in clinical research, as Ivy aptly pointed out. The, the uh, humanness uh, of it has also come out um, as, uh, you know, in general, it has disproportionately affected certain populations, right? Uh, including people of color and those with uh, some of the underlying health conditions. Now, despite these efforts, the challenges remain, uh, including, you know, mistrust in the medical community and clinical research, some of the lack of access um, to healthcare and some of the systemic barriers, right, to participation. Um, so I would say moving forward, we have to make continued efforts to address these um, issues and promote diversity in clinical research. It, it's very critical to do that and ensure that the research findings can be applied 
to all populations, right? And, and improve the health outcomes for everyone. So there's work to be done, uh, but we all understand the magnitude of um, the, the issues and, you know, we are, you know, addressing them uh, head on. Great, thanks, Sunil. And I think that the issue has really sort of taken shape um, as part of the pandemic, um, you know, uh, to, to, to Ivy's earlier point where more organizations have committed itself. You know, the reality is, is that the, the issue around diversity and trials is not new. Um, it's something that we've been talking about. I know personally, I've been talking about for at least the last decade. Um, but, but the reality is there wasn't much of an incentive for many of the, the sponsors or the, the participants really to sort of uh, to think about this problem differently. I think then when you start to compound it with the, some of the, the more macro or the social issues that we have going on within the country, uh, it sort of raised a broader question about inequities in the system across the board. Uh, pharma companies were then charged with really re revisiting um, how we can make an impact uh, in this space. And obviously clinical trial diversity and diverse representation is one. It just happens to be that um, the, the pandemic sort of hit uh, right at that time and really put a, a spotlight on this issue. One of the things that I think that we've learned, uh, you know, across the time, though, it's always interesting when I hear people do sort of racial distribution, um, you know, as part of the, you know, sort of like we look at the U.S., for example, um, the U.S. Uh, racial, and that's sort of what we use as a guiding uh, principle, if you will, to sort of encourage greater diversity in trials. So we said that, for example, if African Americans are 13 percent of U.S. population, you would expect to see 13 percent representation in trials. Um, the downside and what we quickly realized is that um, using census tract data relative to sort of uh, incidents and, and sort of prevalence rates and diseases sort of makes it uh, ineffective, right? So I think that um, as we push for greater represent, representative trials, the goal is to really say representative of the folks afflicted with that disease. And, um, and so therefore, if you're talking about uh, melanoma, for example, then you know that there's a 20% prevalence rate uh, amongst African Americans, so therefore you would want to see close to that, if not that, uh, represented in any trials that you have. The same thing goes for Alzheimer's or any other um, uh, condition that you can have. So I think that, that you know, it's it uh, it's been great to see the sort of catalyst for having this discussion. It's been great to see the regulators take the role of uh, really uh, mandating um, that sponsors get it, so it addresses that incentive issue. Um, but I also think that um, there's opportunities to learn from from different strategies and approaches that we tried and where we are today. Yeah, no, couldn't hear you more, Chris. Um, so, you know, now that we've kind of talked a little bit about the, the problem and kind of where we're at, just want to pivot to some of the barriers that are preventing us from from improving representation in trials. Um, Deloitte had worked with the Pharma Association recently and published a joint paper on enhancing clinical diversity. And these are some of the statistics from that paper. There's over 500 stakeholders involved from 150 different organizations spanning academia, government, patient advocacy groups, community leaders, healthcare providers, CROs, et cetera. So, you know, the main barriers that surface through this work and it's kind of consistent with what you see um, in other publications is, you know, trust, awareness, and access are some of the three main barriers. When you look at, you know, uh, on the trust point, you know, 74% of the pharma members cited that as one of the bigger uh, barriers. Awareness, there's lack of, lack of information around the trials. There's lack of patient awareness. And then there's even patients who are saying that they've never even been asked about participating in trials. And then when you look at access to trials, um, that's one of the main barriers. Accessing meaning, you know, are the sites in the appropriate places of these underrepresented populations? Or are we asking people to drive two, three hours to an academic center? Um, so, and are the investigators representative of the patients that they're trying to recruit as well? So do we have enough minority and ethnically diverse investigators and physicians out there trying to help get, enroll patients in trials? So there's a lot of barriers and, you know, there's probably plenty more on the list. So, so I would ask, um, you know, looking at these barriers, like what do you think is the main barrier in preventing us 
or what's the biggest barrier in preventing us from moving forward? Maybe I'll start with you, Chris. Ah, so it worked this time. All right. Um, um, you know, honestly, um, I, I don't, I don't want to say the trust issue has been sort of overblown because I do believe it's there, but I do think that there's been several generations since things that we've seen, like with the Tuskegee project. So, um, so really, um, um, much of the, those trust issues are sort of passed down from one generation to another that you shouldn't trust trials. But I think we're at a different stage and many people are dealing with some uh, rather serious uh, um, diseases and, and they, they sort of view uh, participation in trials as almost an extension of the clinical care uh, protocol that they're involved in or that they're engaged in. And uh, in some, many cases, it may be the one path to saving their lives or extending their lives and improving their quality of life or uh, a number of things, but I, so I tend to think that if I if you made me choose, um, I would go uh, awareness as being probably the number one issue, um, and and that awareness is because the vast majority of patients are getting their care in com by community providers and, and you know in more community hospitals, not in many of your academic medical centers, which is where many of the trials are taking place, which sort of leads to the access issue, and what we know is that um, when it comes to, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of recruit, uh, you know, um, site investigators, period, but certainly diverse ones, um, because it's, it, it is a, it's, it's viewed as being rather burdensome. It's a lot of work, right? And then and many of them don't have the same infra infrastructure that many of the AMCs have within their environment. So I think that um, if I had to rate them, I would say awareness is one. Don't get me wrong, it's not to understate trust. Um, but I think there's sort of an over, we are, we're over indexing on the trust issue and less about the awareness and the access issue, which involves building an infrastructure in many of these underserved communities. Great. Thanks, Chris. And Sunil, what, what, what are your thoughts? So, so I tend to agree with Chris as well. Um, you know, there are, of course, several barriers that prevent the individuals, right, from participating in clinical trials, but lack of awareness, I would say, is number one because a lot of people are not aware of the clinical trials or may not know how to find the trials that are appropriate for their condition, right, or disease. Um, then, of course, comes mistrust. Um, you know, you know about the trial now, but you're hesitant to participate in the trial due to, you know, historical or some of the ethical concerns about research or the, uh, the mistrust of the medical community. And then comes the lack of access, right, to healthcare. So, uh, particularly in the underserved communities, you know, it can prevent individuals from, you know, participating in the clinical trials. And I want to, you know, um, also enumerate a couple of them uh, in addition to these. So some of the like eligibility criteria, right? So some trials have really strict eligibility criteria that can exclude certain populations or individuals with certain medical conditions. Then you have the, the burdensome requirements um, that the clinical trials may pose uh, for the participants to undergo, you know, frequent testing or treatments, which can be really time consuming and, you know, burdensome. And, and, and last but not least, I would say is the fear of side effects or risks. Um, again, this is kind of tied to trust, but, you know, some individuals may be hesitant to participate in the trials or do, you know, concerns about the potential side effects or the risks of the treatment, uh, you know, treatments being studied. So, um, yeah, so I would say, you know, addressing these barriers, I would say we'll need a, you know, multifaceted approach uh, that increases the awareness, builds the trust with communities and individuals and, you know, kind of improves the access and reduce some of the burden of the eligibility criteria, right, that are overly restrictive. Um, and uh, yeah, so, you know, those are my thoughts. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And um, completely agree with your last point about the eligibility cr criteria and sometimes being too restrictive. There is opportunity there to, to loosen that, to help you know, improve the diversity within trials. So and I, Ivy, would love to get your thoughts too, like on these barriers, like, is there any one that you think is the hardest to overcome? Um, so I actually tend to think that it depends on the underrepresented population um, that you know you're trying to engage the barrier may be different so um, we know that these are all like really important factors um, and there may be different levels of importance as we think about different um, 
groups such as, you know, trust, as Chris, you know, uh, eloquently pointed out, in the Black community, you know, because of the historical abuse, you know, could be um, an issue. Um, we've seen in our, um, actually, one of the recent surveys that we did with our global clinical trial patients that the LGBTQ community also has a really high level of distrust for different reasons. Um, and so I think that, you know, just not blanket, you know, assuming that we know <laughs> what those barriers are and really listening to our patients, um, you know, to me, at least, you know, has been very enlightening. Um, and awareness is definitely another area, as you know, uh, Sunil and Crystal pointed out, is a is huge area of unmet needs. And I would say that, you know, in at least in the U.S., um, there is the um, idea that, you know, if we just translate something to a different language, then we would have met that group's needs. Um, what we don't really um, understand as well is, is it actually culturally appropriate? Can it be received by the patient the same way that you intend to? Because we tend to translate things literally, whether it's Spanish, Chinese, different languages. Um, so, um, you know, even myself, you know, as an example, I was uh, born and raised in Hong Kong. And I, when I first came here as a college student, you know, obviously not as disadvantaged as some of the patients that, you know, we're trying to reach here, but because of language barrier, um, a medical mishap happened and I ended up in the emergency room. So. These are the things that, you know, sometimes we thought that things are translated adequately, but they're not. So uh, when we, when it comes time to thinking about engaging patients in clinical trials, um, you know, the awareness of it, the education, we have to really understand from the community standpoint what it is that they need um, and make sure that beyond translation, we're really reaching out to them in an effective way. Um, and access, again, you know, like both Sunil and Chris pointed out, is a big problem. Um, you know, always using the tried and true site that we know because, you know, the conception that, you know, they can give a speedy result, they can recruit patients quickly. Uh, going to the same site again and again and hoping for a different patient population is, you know, just not going to happen. Um, but to some of the points that they already alluded to, it's difficult to work with um, or to cultivate a new set of uh, investigators in the community who do have the access and trust of these patients. Um, so, you know, a lot of work needs to be done. And from a technology standpoint, you know, I know that during the pandemic, um, there's a lot of discussion about the use of decentralized uh, technologies to help patients access clinical trials. Um, but does that also create a different layer of inequities uh, in, you know, who actually have access to these technologies? Um, so those are all things that, you know, we, uh, I know as an industry, um, as researchers uh, are keenly working on to make sure that, you know, we really put on the lens of, uh, inclusivity and um, uh, an equitable um, engagement to all of our patients. Yeah, no, you, you, that's great. You said something that um, kind of sparked a thought in my head. It's, it's really around challenging like the historic orthodoxies, right? This is this is how we've run trials. This is the sites we go to. The, you know, like unless we start to really flip that, it's fundamentally it's, it's going to be hard to make progress in this space. So you know, when we think Jeff, really quickly, if you if you go back to your prior slide, I think one thing that I would add that I think we're, we're missing is sort of, uh, and, and it's sort of, I'm just looking at the questions that are coming through in the chat, and it, it sort of sparked this thought about the, cater, cater, the characterizing uh, different patients now, right, and our participants potentially. And what I think about is sort of the categories that we use, whether it be about race and gender, if you think about gender and where we are right now, that in of itself would sort of exclude a lot of uh, individuals just by the fact of how they um, they self-designate, right, or how they identify themselves. And so I think that um, as we get into this world and we start talking about the recruitment of pay, uh, participants into trials, you have a trust issue, you have an awareness issue, you have an access issue, but you also have a categorization issue or challenge, right, and how uh, many of these patients truly identify themselves, whether it be racially or gender or, you know, or non-binary or however they choose to to do it. I think it's something that, you know, we don't, we haven't spent a lot of time talking about because I don't think we know how to address it, you know, and, um, but it, but it is something that we need to, to think about. Yeah, no, couldn't agree more. So, and I think I saw some of the questions coming in the chat. I think we could take a couple of those here during during this section. So, you know, want to pivot a little bit to kind of some of the solutions that, you know, we've seen across the industry being deployed and then maybe some specific examples at, at your organizations. But 
you know, this, this list is not meant to be exhaustive, but just kind of spark the discussion, you know, um, institutionalizing a more, more diverse workforce. So not just at the site level, but actually the people working on the development of the medicines. And I view this goes to some of the conversations we had, um, you know, starting in early research, you know, should we be diversifying the workforce and will that help move the needle? Investing in community relationships, building those long-term relationships to support the next generation of practitioners and investigators, um, community-based sites. So this is goes back to that access challenge, right? If everyone has to go to a, a large academic center that could be uh, quite a distance from them, it, it's, it's burdensome. Um, they may not have the means to do it or the time to do it. Um, so we've seen organizations, you know, non-traditional organizations over the last couple of years starting to get into the business of running clinical trials like CVS Health and, and Walmart and, and, and a few others that have a nice footprint across the country um, in all different neighborhoods. So can, can we bring the sites to the patients? Um, same thing with technology. A lot of companies are now starting to experiment with virtual technologies where you're able to collect some of this information directly from patients without having them to come in and do a, a site visit. So decreasing the burden on those patients and even using um, omni-channel approaches to reach and disseminate information about trials and the potential opportunity for trials to, to patients in those underserved areas. So there's a lot of things technology can do to really help move the needle. And, and finally, data. And, and we've kind of touched a little bit on data, but I have Sunil and Chris who are, who are experts in this space and, and how companies are starting now to use data to really either better design their studies to, to your earlier point, Sunil, with the inclusion exclusion criteria and how can we, how can we design them in a way that both meets the research um, agenda, but also um, weighs the, the pros and cons of the burden on the patient to finding investigators who have the right population of patients in the right areas to recruit, um, you know, and to, and to marketing to, to those patients or to being able to get, um, you know, information out about the trial. So data kind of is like the, the backbone for a lot of this stuff. So, you know, maybe, maybe I'll start with you, Ivy, because I know you and I talked about the first point and I thought it was really interesting um, to get your thoughts on these solutions and, and specifically some of the stuff you're doing at Regeneron about, you know, diversifying the workforce, not only the ones working on clinical trials, but all the way from, from bench, bench research. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think that the, every, you know, panelists and, and attendees here, I'm sure has some best practice to share. So um, I'll just share, you know, a few examples that, uh, we're working on right now at Regeneron and it kind of goes with what I mentioned earlier about, you know, how do we truly connect with the patient community that we're trying to um, to reach out to? And so, um, you know, you spoke about, Jeff, a diverse workforce. And, you know, I know that basically every company would say that they're striving for a diverse workforce. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what's important is how do you try to be inclusive of the diverse people? Um, you know, you may have heard of that analogy of, you know, being diverse is, you know, being uh, invited to a dance, but, you know, being inclusive is actually being asked to dance and participate. And so um, I think that it really is a missed opportunity to have a diverse workforce, but not engage them in a way that is meaningful so that we can leverage their cultural expertise and perspectives, uh, language abilities to reach out to our patients. And so an example I'm going to give is uh, actually to some of the questions here. Um, we have also had um, the uh, experience of hearing from our patients that you know LGBTQ plus um, patients are sometimes neglected; their needs are not addressed um, in clinical trials. And so we want to ask you know our global patients, uh, you know what their experiences are in clinical research, you know including the LGBTQ plus community and beyond, um, you know how we can serve them better. Uh, the problem though was when we have the survey written in English, we translate it to six different languages. Um, that was deployed around the world, it was received very differently um, by different countries. And we've heard from some countries where, you know, it's not appropriate to ask about sexual orientation or gender identity. And you should never ask these questions. No one will ever fill out your survey, even though they're anonymous. And so, you know, we want to be inclusive of, you know, all patients. So 
what we uh, ended up doing is uh, partnering with our internal employee resource groups. So at Regeneron, we do have a very diverse workforce. And we have, um, I think currently we have nine different employee resource groups representing employees of different uh, cultural backgrounds uh, and representing different um, demographics. And so uh, we worked with the LGBTQ plus ERG employee resource group, as well as the Asian Pacific Islander resource group. Um, and, you know, trying to understand the perspective, uh, the intersection, because th those feedback we got from certain Asian countries uh, we're asking for these information is not appropriate. So together, we're actually able to engage our employees. Um, so those who identify in these communities, and even, you know, they may not be in a science function. We actually have colleagues from accounting and legal and food services uh, gave us the feedback because, you know, we are in the community and we can say, hey, you know what, this is how you can ask this question to be inclusive, but in a more culturally, uh, culturally sensitive and appropriate way. So that's one way that we are engaging our diverse workforce to make sure that we're reaching out in a genuine way with the community that we're trying to engage uh, globally. Um, and then with the Black community, we also work with our Black ERG um, because, you know, when we do um, educational programs, try to reach out to the community, you know, I, I think sometimes the, the mistrust or worriness comes from the fact that sometimes companies come in and do one thing because I have one child I need to enroll. I want to come in and educate you on this disease and why you need to participate. And then we never go back even to share the results or talk about why it is important, you know, for them to be engaged uh, in a long term, meaningful, sustainable way. So partnering with our own Black ERG employees uh, who are already in the community, they're doing um, community service or participating in uh, different uh, fraternities, sororities, church groups. You know, we're able to leverage that relationship to make sure that, you know, we're engaging with the community in a, a sustainable fashion in the long term and not just, you know, going in with this like, you know, one and done type um, activities. So those are the ways that we are um, leveraging our diverse workforce in building these community relationships. Great. Thanks, Ivy. And Chris, let me turn to you. You know, what are your thoughts on the various solutions and more specifically around data and technology? You know, how, how could we use that to move the needle? And, and maybe what are some of the things you've been doing at AppV? Yeah, I mean, I think that we've, we've, we're technically, I'm sure similar to the others, uh, are touching on every single one of these um, in, in different parts. I think that um, the, the idea of addressing this particular issue is sort of a cross-functional effort where if you think about pharma companies, they usually sort of approach things on a functional basis. Um, but when it comes to this, this issue of, diversity in, in trials, we know it, it's it's a multifunctional effort. So um, so we have a group within um, uh, within R&D that is focused specifically on clinical trial diversity. And uh, and they're more focused on the, I would say your points two and three, um, where they're in, in, you know, sort of building out the community based relationships, um, certainly looking to partner up and identify uh, potential site investigators or um, that that are there that we could potentially explore. Um, but it does fundamentally go back to a point you raised earlier, Jeff, where you talked about um, sort of flipping the um, um, the clinical trial paradigm on its head a bit and really thinking of it differently. Um, and, and no, which goes back to my point about no incentives for change and all these other things, right? It's all about the speed to approval so you can get speed to market. Um, but as it pertains specifically to technology and data, uh, when it comes to technology, that's sort of going back to that, um, you know, original thought I had about the infrastructure being an issue or the lack thereof in many of these underserved communities. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a tremendous amount of investment to build out the infrastructure in many of these communities. It's not just as simple as identifying a site and saying that we're going to make you a trial site. Uh, but I do think um, this idea of, uh, of implementing or utilizing the uh, virtual trials options and many of the digital tech that's out there to reach a broader base of patients um, um, does make a lot of sense. And unfortunately, um, even if you identify sites, you're usually these sites are in urban areas and you do have uh, uh, you know, a significant amount of patients that live in very rural areas or they just can't reach uh, those sites. And even if they live um, in an urban area, like say a Los Angeles, for example, you're looking at a two hour commute um, to that site to participate. So I think the greater adoption of, um, of the technology 
would not only increase the sort of participation of the recruitment efforts, but it would also increase the retention um, issues. That's that, which is a thing that we don't talk about. We talk a lot about sort of the recruitment of diverse patients, but we don't talk about retaining them, which is an issue not only for patients, but also for investigators where you have more than half of them drop out after they do it one time. And it's just because it's a, it's, it's a, it, as I said before, it's a, it's a tremendous amount of work and effort, and it does require things to, um, to look a little different. And so hopefully the tech will sort of uh, raise awareness, would increase the access and also improve retention once we have patients enrolled in the trials. Now, where does this come from, from a data perspective? I mean, I like all the data sources you mentioned. All of them are important for thinking about how we design protocols for many of the studies that we do, um, for what Sunil's earlier point about inclusion, exclusion criteria, and really identifying that and what really sort of how we can loosen or really um, um, define those a bit better. Um, I think it comes into sort of identifying um, what we know to be uh, making sure that we have uh, understanding clinical burden or disease burden in particular populations and where these populations are mostly located. And then that would sort of inform where sites we should be targeting. Um, it's not just as simple as saying, hey, I have a, a, a site in this area. It's pretty diverse. It's also about having the, uh, you know, as I said earlier, that level of prevalence of that particular disease in that community and that sort of drives or at least access to it. And the one thing that I've, that I've appreciated about many of the, the, the major retailers that are now getting into this, this space, this world, is that they do have scale, right? They are in, um, you'll know, you'll hear Walmart, Walgreens and CVS all say that, you know, what the vast majority of Americans live within five miles of one of their, of one of their sites. Um, and I think that scale is incredibly important. Um, and I think that, um, you know, in order to reach many of the patients that we're talking about, which then goes into sort of the, the real world data play, because many of them have, uh, you know, EHRs and they have these capabilities that would allow us to better understand these patients. So. Yeah, that's great points, Chris. Um, Sunil, your thoughts and some of the stuff you've been thinking about at Takeda and, and how your group specifically has been been helping. Yeah, yeah, no, thanks. Uh, so great points, you know, Ivy and Chris. And, you know, just to touch upon what we are doing at Takeda. So some of the examples of how we are um, paving the way to diversity, equity and inclusion, right, in clinical research. So, so the first thing is, so we have this acronym PAVE. So, you know, the first thing is partnering with the community stakeholders. Um, so we are supporting the development of programs to, you know, de-stigmatize the participation in trials by partnership, right, with Xavier University of Louisiana, for example, which is a top ranking historically black college and university and is a trusted institution in a state ranked 50th in health outcome ratings and nearly at the bottom of every measurable health metric. So we are participating, you know, partnership, you know, with them to make sure we are addressing some of these things and we are also identifying some of the community based trial sites in um, you know diverse geographies by working with organizations like the latinos in clinical research whose mission is to increase the latino participation right in clinical research uh, which is again a historically underrepresented population and then we have the a which is addressing the operational barriers that impede the patient access so we want to make sure um, we are ensuring a patient inclusive clinical trial website which you know, introduces a translational tool, uh, making clinical trial details accessible in 34 languages, right? So to Ivy's point, we want to make sure it's, uh, it can be read by a number of people. And we are also incorporating some of the design elements to make that website accessible to people of different ages, cultures, and varying levels of health and uh, technology literacy. And we are also trying to translate all the patient-facing materials into Spanish for our clinical research studies. And, um, and again, we are trying to incorporate hybrid and decentralized trial elements pretty much into, you know, our, our goal is to have that into 100% of our trials by 2025, where we reduce the travel time and in the overall participation burden for the patients. And then we are also, so this is where, you know, I excel. So we are verifying that our diversity and inclusion goals represent real world data. Right. So we are formulating a strategy for the globalization of our uh, clinical trial diversity efforts 
uh, by capturing data on the racial and ethnic demographies of trial participants globally, you know, compared to world population data and disease prevalence. We are also incorporating a, you know, DENI strategy into the clinical trial plan for all the newly initiated trials, which includes a trial diversity goal related to the burden of disease across, you know, different populations. Um, so when it, it comes to data, you know, we are looking at EMR data, we are looking at claims data, lab data. So we want to understand the, you know, burden of disease. We want to, we want to understand the demography, the geography, but most importantly, you know, the, the trial site, um, is it appropriate for that particular disease? Have they seen enough patients, right, over the last two years for that, you know, particular disease? So, you know, data is, you know, extremely important for us, for our strategy, and we are constantly trying to uh, adjust uh, our strategies and our patient recruitment and, um, you know, uh, lead investigators as well as, you know, the trial sites to make sure it's, uh, appropriately uh, representing, you know, the, the disease as well as the population in that area. And last but not least is we are enhancing that diversity of the investigative sites as well, right? So we are partnering with academic institutions like the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development by collecting and reporting on industry-wide uh, diversity data, uh, which informs new, new strategies and policies and practices for more effective partnerships. And last but not least, we are identifying and, you know, prioritizing study sites with greater ethnic and racial diversity um, by doing an assessment of site level diversity within our feasibility questionnaire, uh, which pretty much evaluates the possibility of conducting a trial at a specific site. Um, and we are constantly doing this and, um, you know, as soon as we are thinking about a trial, we start having the DENI, uh, you know, concepts within the trial design as well as a concept right from the beginning. So uh, we'll continue to do that, but uh, yeah, data plays a very important role. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Um, you know, coming, my background is more in the data analytics space. So, you know, seeing companies not only leveraging these types of data sources, but linking them to get a more holistic picture of not only the patient's disease and their treatments, but also some of their, the other factors like race, ethnicity, access to transportation, um, access to uh, proximity to uh, CVS or Walmart. So being able to put all that information into your logic when, when finding sites and, and finding investigators. It's a you know, fascinating space that continues to emerge and, and grow and, and show more value um, in this space. So, you know, talked a lot about diversity in clinical research, but, you know, we know that there's the lack of representation in trials is compounding disparities in health outcomes, and there's potentially serious consequences for underrepresented groups across the nation. You know, there's plenty of examples, whether it's recent with COVID, how certain uh, race or ethnic groups fared a lot worse than others. Um, you know, the, the list goes on like this is more far reaching than we just don't have the right patients in the right trials. Um, you know, so question for the panelists, like if we don't improve representation in trials, like, like what are the real ramifications here? It's not just the research isn't representative, but like, what, what does it mean to healthcare? Maybe I'll start with you, Sunil. Me, me, Jeff, do you yeah. mention me? Okay, great. Yeah. So, um, I would say the consequences of you know underrepresentation in clinical research you know is pretty far reaching and it can have significant implications for health outcomes for all populations right so um when certain groups are underrepresented in research it can limit the the generalizability of the research findings to those populations um it can also lead to inaccurate and incomplete understanding of how some of the treatments and interventions work in those populations and it can result in you know, great disparities in healthcare. Um, for example, if a medication is tested, you know, tested primarily in white men and found to be effective, it may not be clear, you know, whether it will be as effective or safe for women or people of color or other underrepresented groups. So this can lead to, you know, under treatment, over treatment, or 
some of the inappropriate treatments for these populations, right, which can have a negative impact uh, on health outcomes. Um, and additionally, um, the underrepresentation in clinical research can actually uh, perpetuate uh, health disparities and exacerbate some of the health inequalities. So, you know, without having the uh, adequate representation in the trials, individuals from the groups, you know, that are not well represented may not have access, right, to some of the cutting edge treatments and interventions which can lead to further uh, disparities in health and uh, and overall i would say um you know increasing the diversity and you know representation on in clinical research is extremely critical uh, to ensure that you know the research findings can be applied to all the populations and improve the health outcomes um yeah so uh, you know constant uh, iteration but it's happening and we have to you know keep addressing that no, thanks, Neil. And Ivy, your thoughts? Like, what are the ramifications if we don't get this right? Yeah, so I agree with, you know, all the points that, you know, Sunil stated as well as on the slides here. And I'll go so far to say that if we don't have, you know, diverse representation of all patients that may end up using your therapy, you can actually be doing active harm in some patients. And the reason I say that is because, you know, in this age of precision medicine, personalized medicine, you know, there is more and more sophisticated ways that we can define um, the way that disease rep is represented and manifest in uh, different patients, uh, supposedly. Um, so a lot of therapeutics today, as you can imagine in cancer therapeutics, for example, you know, we really rely on biomarkers to guide our treatment uh, for patients um, to the best treatment that is available to them. Um, but the flaw in this thinking is that the biomarkers, if they're not collected and done in a diverse population, then they may only apply to certain patients. And, you know, as a lot of us pointed out, the white majority patient populations. So when we apply that to all patients that end up, you know, um, uh, coming into your, um, uh, uh, the, the world of using these therapies, you can potentially guide the wrong patients into the wrong therapy if you're using flawed biomarkers. And so, um, you know, at Regeneron, um, you know, some folks may not know, we have one of the world's largest uh, exome sequencing facilities in the world. And so one of our main goal is to kind of, before even the phases of clinical trial, looking at preclinical studies and genomic um, discovery, are we really looking at a diverse enough population so that the discoveries that we make before they even enter the clinic are representative of all patients. So when we develop our um, geno uh, exome data, um, you know, we're partnering and really cognizant of partnering with researchers around the world that historically do not have access to genomics research. So you may have heard of the statistics that 80% um, of the world's genomic data comes from uh, patients of uh, European ancestry. So the results that we get from these genomic research, um, a lot of times are not applicable to everyone. So um, our center has, you know, really, um, you know, increased our partnership with these um, researchers that collect uh, genomic data from uh, patients from non-European ancestry to diversify our genomic database so that the discoveries that we make, um, and we do share actually the genomic results that we have um, uh, exome sequenced with um, other researchers so everyone can do research based on more accurate data that reflects the diversity of humanity. And so uh, without that, I feel like, you know, we could be going down a slippery slope of thinking that we are being more inclusive of patients, but we're not. So um, I feel like, you know, that's an area of focus that, uh, um, that I want to highlight on. Yeah, no, that's great. And something that I, you know, I tend not to think about is how far reaching, you know, it can be from that perspective. Um, anything else to add, Chris, from your perspective? I don't know if there's much substantive to add, but I think I'll just reiterate a point that I think Ivy made that may um, so folks, folks really focus on it is to sort of um, path to sort of precision health or personalized um, health that we seem to be on. And, uh, and the reality is, is that, you know, when you have that lack of representation and you're essentially, um, you, you, it makes the data non-generalizable, right? Which, um, uh, which ultimately affects uh, different subpopulations and 
results in suboptimal outcomes, right? You know, I mean, that's just part of this whole thing. And I think that uh, it seems that um, if we really are living by the uh, Hippocratic oath of do no harm, then you would think that we would want to ensure that all people are reflected in many of the clinical research that uh, many of the clinical studies that we're, we're doing and we're executing on. So I think um, it's not, it's no longer an op there's no longer optionality in in really uh, determining whether you want to have representative trials or not. This is a matter of how do you execute it is really where we are with this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have about eight minutes left. There's a couple questions in from the audience, but maybe let's here, actually let's take those questions because I think it won't, it won't take too much time. Um, so one question, how, how much do you think the trialist clinicians have a misconception about how willing certain groups are to participate um, due to historic atrocities? So are less likely to invite them to the research and how can this be addressed? Anyone have thoughts on that? I'm not sure I fully caught the question. Can you repeat it again? Yeah. It is, how much do you think trialists have misconceptions about how willing certain groups are to participate due to historic atrocities? So they're less likely to invite them. So, you know, the, um, you know, perceived bias, right? They, they think, oh, the, we all know the atrocities that have happened with some of the trials. This, um, and so this might be limiting certain investigators from even inviting those patients to invite new trials because of their past bad experience. Yeah, I mean, it's funny, I mean, because that's sort of what I was saying when I said over indexing on the trust issue and, yeah. and not really giving uh, credence to the fact that some folks are several generations from some of those historical atrocities and they just many, many may not even know what it is. You know, if I'm being totally honest, I think sometimes I think when we're in healthcare in the life sciences world, we live in a bit of a bubble and we assume that the average uh, citizen has um, all the knowledge in history of, of clinical trials and they many do not. You know, I think that if anything, many of the lessons uh, that are passed down, you know, within certain uh, populations or cultures is more because that's what your parents and your grandparents said you should or should not do. Right. But they don't. Um, but oftentimes they, they're not connecting it back to, uh, you know, the Henrietta Leak lacks of the world and these different people. I mean, they don't they don't know who they are. Right. And so I, I can probably go and I'm, I'm speaking from firsthand experience because I can probably ask uh, many of my family members if they know about it. And I can almost assure you that the many would not. And so I think um, but so I do think there's a level of implicit bias by sponsors and by uh, many of the investigators and in assuming that people would not want that option. And, um, and I also think because of that, there's a lack of education to those uh, prospective participants or in their families about what the possibilities could be. Um, I think that um, I've, been, I've met folks who, uh, many patients who have, once they found out about, about a clinical trial and they, they saw the actual clinical benefit or potential benefit to them, they were more than willing to move to another state to participate in a trial. So, um, so, and now, and those were people of diverse, uh, you know, uh, 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 diverse backgrounds, right? And and so, I don't, I, I think, to assume that folks of a particular group all think and all all think the same, all have the same access to the same information, and have the same beliefs, it's just, um, I think, it's misguided, you know, and it's it's ill informed. It's like assuming that all African Americans think the same, and therefore, if I have this one sort of intervention strategy, it will work for the entire uh, uh, population of folks, and that's just not that's not very true. But I'll defer to, to Ivy because she does this every day. No, I absolutely agree with what you said. I think the underlying, um, you know, fault in that is is the assumption that we make. Um, you know, the more we do research, I think the more we understand that there are just so much multifactorial reasons why there are barriers to patients participating in clinical trials. And I think that sometimes, you know, we default to thinking of certain stereotypes, like, you know, this is why you don't participate. This is why you shouldn't participate. 
And so again, I think the the take home point is, you know, for all of us, you know, in whether it's sponsor or researchers, to kind of try to be cognizant of our own bias. Not that you're wrong, but I mean, as people, we all have biases to kind of try to, you know, check your own bias um, before you make any assumptions about your patients. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Chris and Ivy. So, so one other question from the panel, and then we could start to wrap up. So what does the panel think about how much we pay trial participants? There's a study to suggest that paying a lot can help bridge the gap. Have others looked into the size of the compensation? Any thoughts from anyone on that one? It's a very touchy yeah, I, topic. I, 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 <laughs> go ahead, Chris. No, you go ahead. <laughs> you can have it. I mean, you know, everything is a burden, right? I mean, you know, to 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 move the needle, right? In in the overall thinking process and and the self-imposed barriers and some of the unconscious biases, there has to be a concerted effort from all angles, right? It's not just one division, one group. So there is there is an economic burden. Uh, there is an investment. So when we are doing community outreach programs, when we are partnering with academic medical centers, when we are trying to do decentralized trials, but, you know, have some of the folks who don't have the technology, right? Give them, you know, the technology for free. All this costs money, but eventually it's going to help, you know, the health outcomes and mankind. But yes, there is an economic burden. We do pay. Uh, it, it doesn't cost as much as actually running the clinical trials, but there is a cost component to it, which uh, we cannot ignore. Yeah, no, thank, thanks, Samuel. So with the remaining two minutes, I just wanted to give each of you guys an opportunity, just with a closing remark, maybe one key message you could leave the audience with as they go back into their respective organizations and think about how they're going to advance diversity in research you know, what would that key message be? And then, you know, how do you measure success in this space? So maybe start with you, Chris. How do you measure success in this space? Um, I think that, you know, it's always important that we start with the end in mind. And I don't mean that to be cliche, but I do really mean that. And I think that ultimately what we want to do is um, make this a part of the way we sort of do business or the way we operate in the clinical research world and not um, sort of a nice to have or some separate initiative that is uh, that that is, seems like it's going on into perpetuity, right? I think that um, it should not be uh, if we, you know, so we have this sort of we're at a we're at a precipice where we really need to sort of reimagine the whole clinical research enterprise, you know, in its entirety. And that's and, and it should be better incorporating um, all the things you mentioned from the data and tech that you mentioned on the previous slide, Jeff, to the way that we think about site selection and site investigators, to the way we sort of create omni-channel ways or approaches to engage with many of our uh, uh, potential participants in these in these studies. And I just think that um, we, in, in order to do that, you know, and sort of if you think about the vision and you think about what the end goal is, then you should sort of develop a roadmap and how you would achieve that and you get there and you measure yourself just like you would with any other initiative. I think what we've done is sort of um, accept it, whether we've done it consciously or subconsciously, that this is an ongoing problem that can never be solved for. So therefore, we haven't put in the appropriate metrics and accountability to ensure that it's actually getting addressed, right? We just feel like we may well, we made some marginal improvements, so therefore that's good. Yeah, last year we were at 10%, this year we're at 12%. That's good enough, you know, and, and, and it's not. And, and we wouldn't treat any other business imperative in that way, right? I think if you make the investment and we say that at this point, this is where we are. In five years, I expect this problem to be solved for at least in the way we do business. And, uh, and that to me is the only way you really get there rather than it being sort of this ongoing dialogue and we're constantly five years from now having the same discussion that we're having right now about how do we think of ways to improve rep, uh, diversity in trials. I think it's, it's, you know, to me, it's it's laughable because I think that um, if there were any other burning platform, it would not require this level uh, of attention and effort and we would have solved this already. So um, 
And I'm on a soapbox, but I'll let the others. <laughs> I, Ivy, your key takeaway for the audience? Sure. I think we're out of time, so I'll be very, very brief. So I think to, um, you know, uh, my point earlier, um, all of us, you know, I think I want to challenge um, you to check your assumptions about what you think you know about barriers in clinical trial participation. So the more I do this, the more I realize I don't know everything. And some of my assumptions actually were not correct, uh, especially the broad sweeping, um, you know, stereotypes that you often hear repeated. So I would say anytime anyone tell you, well, actually, that's not how it is. Um, try to take a moment, take a break in your day and reflect on it and think about, you know, why that is and uh, see if you can find um, a new perspective and a new solution to the problem. Great. Thanks, Ivy. And, and Sunil, final thoughts? Yeah, so, you know, quickly, um, I would say, you know, diversity and equity and inclusion should not be just a check mark. Uh, make sure we all completely believe in it, are passionate about it, and understand what that outcome would be, right, by, by doing the right things for DE and I. Um, and uh, make sure you measure um, your progress every few months, you know, and year, whatever that be, you know, don't just um, do something and incorporate programs and, and not have a proper measure, right, of where you are. So uh, the first slide had those, uh, you know, percentages of, uh, you know, racial and, you know, ethnic, um, you know, diversity, right? Make sure that that graph is going up and, and, and but more importantly, make sure the the impact is also measured right that um, the the right kind of medicines are getting to the right patients uh, you know uh, in, in the most equitable way and uh, you know and keep doing it sure. it's a journey well, yeah couldn't agree more well i know we're a little bit over time so sunil ivy chris thank you for the discussion i hope the audience found it useful um, like I said, the recording will be sent out to everybody. Um, if there's any other questions, feel free to reach out to me directly and try to get those addressed. But thanks again for your time and enjoy the rest of your day.